Are we on yet? Great. Well, welcome, everybody. It's good to see some faces I haven't seen for a while. Thanks for being here. And you all got so quiet when it turned 629. I didn't even have to bang, bang the gavel. How nice. So, any teachers out there? No teachers? I was going to say, just one? Yeah, don't you wish the classroom was always like that? So, so let's call the meeting to the uh, Santee City Council to order Wednesday, January 11th, 2023. It's now 6.30 p.m. Let the record reflect that we do have all council members present and accounted for. The legislative invocation tonight will be given by Pastor Ted Brent. And here's a little... You can applaud if you want, but I'm, I'm going to say a little um, bio here, so, uh, and then we'll follow the, um, the invocation with the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Uh, and uh, tonight, you know what? Uh, I'm going to call on retired Fire Chief uh, John Garlow to lead us in that Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Yep, last chance to get you, so. So uh, the um, invocation tonight will be by Pastor Ted Brent. He serves the Skyline Lakeside Church, oversees and manages all campus ministries and functions, performs pastoral care, and organizes support at community events. Pastor Brent has been a member of Skyline Church for three years and was hired as campus pastor almost a year ago. He received his degree in English and a master's degree in education from SDSU, as well as a master's degree in Christian ministry from Southern California Seminary. Pastor Brent has been married to his wife, Jolie, for almost 30 years. Congratulations, sir. And they have four children, two boys who have graduated from high school, and twin seventh-grade girls. I'm a twin, so I'm saying good luck with that one as they grow up. Uh, he was an English teacher at West Hills High School for 28 years. 18 of whom he was a bivocational pastor at a church in El Cajon. So wearing two hats at that time, I guess, yes. And Pastor Brent is blessed to have worn many hats over the year, including the pastor of the middle school, high school, college, and young adult administrative and service pastor. At the end of last school year, he resigned from teaching to lead the campus at Skyline Lakeside and is blessed to teach middle school at Skyline Christian Academy and English classes at San Diego Christian College. The pastor is a big fan of sushi and chocolate. Not at the same time. Good decision, Pastor. Thank you. And um, we want to thank you for being here tonight. Please pray for, God, uh, for God's blessing on our nation, our state, and our city council. Please rise for the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for these people gathered here together, both uh, to serve the city and because they love the city. We pray for tonight there to be wisdom and just discernment, Lord. We pray that you're honored in our discussion and discourse. God, this is a great city. You are a giver of all good gifts, Lord, and this city is a gift. It's been a great privilege and pleasure of my life to teach the children of this community for almost 30 years, and it is a beautiful place to live. It is a beautiful place to work. It is a gem. And Lord, I pray that tonight that uh, those gathered here, we are united in purpose to, to make this city even a better place to be. We pray and lift up for all those that pour in their lives as uh, business owners, as first responders, uh, city council members, and, and all those that both live and work in this city that call it home, but all also call it a, a place that they love dearly. So all these things, Lord, we just lift up to you tonight, and we thank you for allowing us to be a part of something great, something beautiful, uh, a place that, that people cherish, a place that people can call home, uh, and, and Lord, a place that, that is a great place to, to raise families, to, to live, to work, and, and all things, Lord, uh, we ask that you are glorified. And we pray these things in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. Amen. Please join me in honoring our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Yeah, let's see. Uh, we're going to start this off with uh, s some fun stuff, and uh, that is uh, honoring uh, ret the retirement of Fire Chief John Garlow, who we heard from just a moment ago. And um, so, John, why don't you come on down here in the front, bring uh, your family with you if you like, and we'll see how we can roast you here for a few minutes. I know you have some colleagues here also that uh, might want to uh, have a few words. Yes, one, two, three. Can you hear me out there? Yes. Great, thank you very much. Hey, uh, Rob, can you do me a favor uh, when I get up there, hand these things over to me? Thanks. I put everybody to work, you know. Glad I got to take first shot over your bow with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> uh, what you don't know is that I um, don't have it planned out. I look around the room before every council meeting and say, all right, who we could pick on tonight. And so some people are very surprised. So, and tonight was your night. What I have here is a, a proclamation, City of Santee, and it says, Whereas Chief John Garlow began his fire service career in 1990 for the San Diego Rural Fire Protection District. Whereas Chief Garlow served the community of Santee for over 23 years, beginning in June 1999, when he was hired as a firefighter apprentice with the Santee Fire Department. And whereas Chief Garlow promoted through the ranks from firefighter apprentice to firefighter paramedic, fire engineer, fire captain, fire division chief, and ultimately fire chief, the highest ranking position in the Santee Fire Department. Isn't that every fire department? Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, whereas Chief Garlow has been a leader in the fire department responding to thousands of emergency calls before officially retiring from the city of Santee on December 28, 2022. And whereas under Chief Garlow's leadership, the Santee Fire Department has navigated the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas Chief Garlow successfully led the transition from the County Service Area 69 to the Santee Lakeside Emergency Medical Services Authority, bringing local control under the Santee Emergency Medical Services. No small feat, and we thank you very much for that. And whereas throughout his career, Chief Garlow has responded to many major emergency incidents, including the 1993 Guido, if I said that correctly, Guido, um, fire. <coughs> Give me a break there for a second. I tried. <laughs> um, I got to figure out where I was here again. Um, uh, in uh, 1996, Harmony Grove Fire, the 2003 Cedar Fire, and I think you and I were there on that one together. Uh, the two, uh, the two, um, 2008 Oliver Lighting Complex Fire. And whereas the Santee Fire Department will remember Chief Garlow as an exceptional leader and a dedicated husband to Deborah and father to John Jr., who inspired confidence and respect through dedication, loyalty and countless hours serving the Santee community. He will be greatly missed by those who were privileged to know and work with him. Now, therefore, I, John Minto, Mayor of the City of Santee, on behalf of the City Council, do by proclaim that Fire Chief John Garlow has been an exceptional member of the City of Santee organization and community that he received due recognition and commendation for superior dedication in the performance of his duties, and appreciation for his exemplary career of public safety service, wishing him the very best in all his future endeavors. Congratulations, John.
Well, we have any uh, colleagues that want to come up and say something before we go to the family? Here's your chance. You don't work for them anymore. <laughs> Fire, no, no firefighters want to come up and say anything. Captain Doe, I saw you walk in late back there. <laughs> <laughs> Look at they're still scared of you. <laughs> the two of you like to say something before I give him the microphone? <laughs> he says enough. All right, then. You know, I, I'm just going to say this. You know, we, we worked together a long time. I've been on the council a long time. And uh, we've done everything from go out to that uh, Cedar Fire together. And why I saw firsthand how firefighters work and learned that uh, there's no way any civilian could ever have any idea what a fire does, when it does it, and how it does it. Your training and experience is just unbelievable. And that's not just for you but it's for every one of the firefighters that we have. Biggest difference is that when you get up in the ranks, you have to make a decision. And that decision is made with all that experience and also some collaboration. And uh, so everything is done very well. Um, I remember the days we used to go out and do the Relay for Life the, for cancer, raising lots of money to help people. Uh, that's another thing that you did along the way that was just... Uh, very memorable for me. And if anybody else probably in the community was there, they probably remember firefighters being there because we did pretty well. So with that, I'm going to say, have the microphone and please say a few words. Oh, thank you very much. Is this on? Is it working? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. I just want to say thank you um, to the council, to city manager Marlene Best for taking a chance on me. Thank you so much for the council for being so supportive over the years. Um, I know you don't always get the recognition you deserve for the things you do for the department, but it's considerable and it, it's, it's very well um, appreciated. Chief Matsushita, as my deputy chief, I couldn't have asked for a better, uh, a better right hand man. Um, you're incredible. You're the right person to lead us into the future and the department into the future. Uh, over the next couple of years, you'll see more change than in the last 45, and you are the right person. So congratulations. Um, to my family, my wife, Deborah, my son, thank you so much for the support, the unconditional hugs when I got home after shifts, the, uh, the support of just being there every, through thick and thin. Um, love you both. Oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> Um, before I give out some of these parting gifts, I'm going to ask the council if they'd like to say something. Council, any sure. comments? Yeah, yeah. go. <laughs> Chief Carlo has been, uh, as just been a class act from start to finish. You've uh, been an exemplary um, example of what what a chief should look like, perform like. Stay cool, calm, collected at all times, and always has a smile on his face. Um, one of the coolest things that I, I mean, we've known each other for a while now, but one of the coolest things I actually heard you say ever was at your retirement gathering. And I said, okay, now what are you going to do? Because most times chiefs go and they take over another department or they you know, do something else in, in the line. And you said, I'm spending time with my family. Amen. That was really cool. And, uh, and I'm happy that you're going to be able to do that and uh, your family's going to get to see you all the time now. I'm sorry and happy that the family's <laughs> going to get to see you all the so time now. God bless you for all you did for the city of Santee. God bless you for what you do for your family and I wish you nothing but the very best. Anybody else? You know, let's start with uh, Deb. Deb, thank you. You always got to thank the wife for, you know, anybody in public service, obviously, you know, go through a lot and through your whole career and in life, you know, have that support system. So thank you, Deb. Chief, I, you know, the last couple of years, we've had a lot of retirements around here, a lot of department heads, and, and it's hard to see any of them go. It's hard to see, you know, but everybody that has left, you know, recently has put an, a tremendous amount of time into the city of Santee, and you're no exception for that. 23 years, you know, serving the city of Santee and come to the ranks, obviously, is a, a great career and you know, something you should be very proud of. There's, there's always a, that saying, though, know, that you... Everything that you do, you want to leave a place better than where you left it. And I think you did that, in my opinion, for the last 
was it three plus years as the chief now, you know, I, I think you can proudly say that, you know, to yourself that you left this department better than you know, where you left it, even though each predecessor before you did an amazing job also. You gave these guys something else to, to move forward. Like you said, with Chief Matashita, he's got something to keep running with right now. So that's because of you. So congratulations and enjoy your retirement. My turn. <laughs> Hi, friend. <laughs> Hi, family. Love you guys. Um, so everybody said great things about your career, um, and they're all true. Personally, um, these last couple of years getting to know you really well, I, I'm just so honored to I feel like you're a friend, you know, and that's, and you are. And uh, I just bonded with you and your wife instantly when I, you know, met you. But I just want everybody to know what, you know, he, he doesn't take much recognition. He's a very humble man, very kind man. Um, but what he did behind the scenes to help dissolve CSA 69 is legendary. The city's going to benefit forever for the work you put in. And I know the work you put in. Um, I thank you for welcoming me onto that board. And somehow you maneuvered me to be chair. <laughs> and I know you did that. Uh, I, I hadn't served a day. <laughs> and I, I know that that was a lot of work and, and maybe a little strategy, too. Um, but you explained everything you were trying to accomplish, and you did it. So congratulations. Um, I'm so proud of you and so happy for your retirement. Thanks. I'll be brief. Well done. You've done a great job while you've been here. One thing people don't realize is the uh, Santee Fire Department is uh, – ISO 1, and it, a lot of people wonder what that means. That means it's basically the top uh, rating you can get for insurance for fire departments. And the fact that they have that tells you how good a job they've done. That they've protected the city from the 2003 fires. They've protected it from a lot of things, and it's excellent job. You've done a great job. Congratulations. Thank you. Not seeing any other hands. Well, let's see. I'm not sure what all's in here. I'll let you open this up, but we just have a few of these things for you. Uh, probably some T-shirts and hats, and you know, little things like that. Christmas ornaments. Oh. Oh, okay. Now, I'm I'm just the mayor, so let me know what you want me to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will be using this quite often. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> What's the sparkly thing? Oh, it's a That's a uh, $50,000 bracelet. <laughs> and, and then you woke up. All right. Is it engraved? What does it say on it? Fire Chief John Garlow, 22 years, City of Santee. All right. Might as well go ahead and dig into this one, too. I'll hold it for you. <laughs> Didn't want you to feel lonely, so we got your own rig. It's the only one I'll be on for a while. <laughs> you know, that just conjured up uh, something I just can't get out of my mind for the future. <laughs> You've been on that rig. <laughs> you have bought us a lot of rigs. So yeah, we have. The last one. Yeah. Great. Now, don't lose that. You may need it. Sign the checks, you know. All right. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks for everything. Thanks, John. All right, that takes us to our next recognition, which is in memory of Shanine Johnson. And um, Vice Mayor Koval is going to make that presentation. Am I on? Family, if you want to come up, or friends. Family and friends.
Don't be shy, everybody. Family and friends. She's a lot friendlier than I am. Come on over here. Some, some of you on this side. She's a lot friendlier than I am, so don't worry. Thank you. Say hi. Santee TV. Hi. There you go. Ah. <laughs> okay, so today we're here to celebrate um, Shanine Johnson. I knew her as Shanine Bazor, but Shanine mm -hmm. Johnson. Um, and I have a proclamation to read. Whereas Shanine Johnson grew up in Lakeside, California, where she gra graduated from El Capitan High School and lived in Lakeside, California, and was a member of the church in Santee, where Shanine was married to her husband, Tom, for 35 years and had two children, Holly, if you want to wave, and Brandy. And she absolutely adored her four grandchildren, Lexi, Blaine, Riley, and Ernie. Emery. Emery, sorry. Anyway. I'm sorry. So sorry. Shanine worked in the mortgage industry for over 20 years. She was the co-founder of Naomi's Closet and started a similar boutique at McAllister Women's Recovery Center treatment program called Kiva. And Shanine was the founder of Shanine's Kids, where each year she coordinated present, presentation of Christmas presents for over 100 children that, that are living with their parents at the East County Transitional Living Center. And it was Shanine's wish to collect money and donate donate it to the East County Transitional Living Center. I, Laura Koval, on behalf of the Mayor of City Santee and the City Council, do hereby proclaim that Shanine Johnson received due recognition and commendation for a lifelong, lifetime of outstanding service and dedication to the citizens in the City of Santee. Thank you. So I did want to share a few a, a personal, I knew Shanine personally, um, actually I just found out from her mom Darlene, back to uh, Lakeview Elementary School. Uh, she is a year younger than I am, and so, you know, when you're in elementary school and junior high, we both went to TDS and we both went to El Cap. A year difference is kind of like a lifetime then, right? But there were a lot of stand rings that went to El Cap, and she was good friends with my younger sister Kelly, and my cousin Tom. So Kelly <laughs> shared with me, she texted me uh, yesterday and said that her nickname for Shanine, your mom, was uh, uh, General Bazaar. <laughs> Camp director. Yeah. And, uh, and my, my sister's nickname was Kegger Kelly. So, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> but moving forward through the magic of Facebook, Shanine and I connected. I think she actually reached out to me and I started noticing all the community work that she was doing and I thought, wow, I have a bunch of clothes in my closet and so I went over to Naomi's Closet. It's, if you haven't ever donated to Naomi's Closet, please do. They take women's clothes it's help, to help women get back on their feet and get out into the workforce. What's the church in Santee that they're located at? Santee United Methodist. Santee United Methodist. A little cute. They're in the back parking lot. In there. Cute building in the back. Um, and so I went down and I, you know, brought my bags of clothes and purses and then we started chatting. And then um, fast forward, I, worked, I used to work for the San Diego Padres and Tony Patrica, who you all might know very well, obviously he worked there too. And so Lisa and Tony were having a birthday party at their house and I came over, for one of their sons, and I came over and Shanine was there sitting by the pool and I sat down next to her and we just started, we just hit it off, like, you know, didn't skip a beat. Um, and, and that's how our friendship grew as adults. And she's just, you know, discovering all the things she did selflessly for the community. She's just, you know, such a wonderful person, truly, truly missed. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody in Santee knew what a treasure we lost in Shanine. Thank you. And now, if anybody from the family would like to say anything, I have a microphone. I can say that she did truly love helping all the people in Santee. And was endless with getting stuff dropped off at the house that I got to help her with, but uh, endless, endless hours. But she loved it. She loved everybody. And loved to help everybody. Done. We have a celebration of life uh, Sunday. Yeah. So I'm going to save my speech best for another. Thank you. Thank you. Though.
Thank you, everybody. And um, yes, Celebration of Life for Shanine is at the Elks on Sunday, right? Yes. I think there's already over 400. It's 465 right Yeah, so there's going to be a big turnout. One o'clock at the Elks Club. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That takes us to the next item, which are uh, the agenda and the consent calendar. Are there any items to be added, deleted, or reordered? Ron? No. Laura? No. Dustin? No, sir. Council Member McNellis? No, sir, Mr. Mayor. I have none. City Manager? No, sir. City Attorney? No, sir. Are there any speaker slips? No, sir. Okay. Motion Thank to you. approve. Second. Um, I have a motion to approve by Councilmember McNellis, second by Councilmember Trotter. Please vote. Lock in your votes. Councilmember Hall, can you please lock in your vote? <laughs> Apparently not. Motion carries unanimously. That takes us to our, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that takes us to our next item, which is Non-agenda public comment. I have three speakers. The first speaker, Rebecca Phillips. A reminder, you have three minutes. Welcome. Good evening, council members and residents of Santee behind me. <laughs> My name is Rebecca Phillips, and I'm 17 years old. I am not a resident of Santee, but I am employed at a local restaurant, the Omelette Factory, and I work out regularly at the Santee YMCA. Just two weeks ago, after finishing my shift at my job, I went to the gym to swim laps. As I was showering after my workout, I saw a naked male in the women's locker room. I immediately went back into the shower, terrified, and hid behind their flimsy excuse for a curtain until he was gone. I ran into a bathroom stall to change as quickly as I could, organizing my thoughts to share with the people at the front desk. As I did so, I could only think of my five-year-old sister, who I bring to this gym during the summer to, sorry, to enjoy their water slides. This is the YMCA, where hundreds of children spend their summer afternoons in childcare camps. This is the YMCA where my little sister took gymnastics lessons the locker room was supposed to be her safe haven to gossip with her friends and shower and change. When I asked the YMCA management what their policy was regarding transgenders, they confirmed that the man that I saw was indeed allowed to shower wherever he pleased. As long as you are not a red flag on Megan's Law, the California Sex Offender Registry, a grown male can shower alongside a teenage girl at your YMCA location here in Santee. I was made to feel as though I had done something wrong when I talked to people at the YMCA. Somehow, the indecent exposure of a male to a female minor was an inconvenience to them. When my dad spoke to the sheriff's office, they told him that he should never allow me to shower there ever again. The YMCA wouldn't let my father speak to the manager of the Santee branch. After waiting several days, he finally received a call from Terry Moss, who is the director of membership for San Diego County. She informed my dad that I was not in any danger at the time of the incident, that I was safe. But I ask you this, I'm assuming all of you either have a wife, a sister, daughters or granddaughters or are a woman yourself. Could you knowingly send an underage girl into a room where there was a naked male and say that she was not in danger, that she was safe, or more importantly, that this was right? The fact that we are now tailoring our privacy policies and bathroom laws around transgenders, ignoring the blatant threat to safety that this poses is obscene. The safety of children, girls, is on the chopping block. And this issue is not unique to one political party. Both Democrats and Republicans whom I have shared this story with have all been equally disgusted. So I implore you all to take action. 
with great privilege comes great responsibility. Whether it's requiring transgenders to use the single cell family restrooms or making them use the bathroom which aligns with their biological trans. Thank you, thank you. Next speaker I have is Dr. Brian McKinney. Welcome. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Minto, council members, and residents of the city of Santee. My name is Dr. Brian McKinney. I am the new dire assistant director at CASA, and I'm excited today to talk with you about a topic that is very important to me, health outcomes for our communities. As a doctor, it is very easy for me to say that tobacco use leads to disability, disease, and death. That is 100% true. It is also something we have likely heard before. And if the conversation stops there, I'm concerned that we might forget that we now know so much more about tobacco, about nicotine, about addiction, that we can actually prevent some of that disability, that disease, and that death. Because what can be a little harder to talk about, and what is very important to me as a doctor, are health outcomes. Understanding not only where we are, but also what that means for our communities. And asking what is our role in this process. So I'd like to start by talking about where we are in terms of adult versus adolescent use of tobacco products, specifically e-cigarettes, or as the kids are calling them, vapes. A recent study found that 3% of adults in California use e-cigarettes, one of the lowest in our country, actually. Compare that to a recent study of youth risk behaviors in California found 18.2% of high school students in California use vapes. That's over 370,000 high schoolers, and almost half of them report being daily users. 96% of them who do vape use, use flavors, and flavors have disproportionately affected our kids. And these numbers actually have real health consequences for our communities. Every year, 6,800 kids in California become new daily users of tobacco products. And then the evidence becomes strikingly clear. For every teenager who develops a nicotine addiction before the age of 18, one in three will quit, but two out of three will go on to develop a lifetime nicotine addiction, and half of those who do will die from a tobacco-related illness. That number is 441,000. That is the number of kids alive in California today who will ultimately die prematurely from using tobacco products. That is why I'm here today because of those 441,000, because I have hope that those deaths can be prevented. I believe that prevention plays a huge role here and that preventing youth access to tobacco products is extremely important. So today, I ask that you please consider your important role as policymakers in the city of Santee to please help prevent these deaths. I have a quick question. Medical doctor? Yes. Thank you. The last speaker I have is Jean Duffy. You have three minutes. And a reminder to anybody who wants to speak on item 10, we need your speaker slip before the item is called. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Mayor and City Council members and staff and community members. Um, so I'm Jean Duffy. Some of you may know me from Compoc um, as a member of the Santee Collaborative and as a public health advocate for CASA. So I'm here to give you some information about the flavored tobacco law um, that went into effect for the state of California on December 21st. So you probably know that Prop 31 passed, um, upholding Senate Bill 793, which prevents retailers from selling most flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes and flavored vapes. This statewide law follows the leadership of more than 100 cities and counties that have already ended the sale of flavored tobacco products. Big Tobacco tried to fight these results by filing a motion to be heard at the Supreme Court, but they wouldn't even hear the case. So we know that 95% of adult smokers started, started before they were legally allowed to purchase tobacco products. And the tobacco industry hooks kids on vapes by using fun candy flavors that spark curiosity and make tobacco taste and smell good. Um, that's put kids at risk of a lifetime of nicotine addiction, health problems, and premature death. We also know that if we make these products less accessible, fewer young people will use them. 
It is up to cities to make sure their stores are no longer selling flavored tobacco products. Local jurisdictions can ensure compliance by adopting a tobacco retailer license ordinance, which would, through the retailer fee, pay for compliance checks annually to not only check the sale of flavors, but also to assess if retailers are illegally selling to minors. This is something you should be concerned about, because when we set CASA sent in underage youth into all your tobacco retail, retailers, retail stores um, in Santee to purchase tobacco products, 68% of retailers sold, and that's a really high sales rate. Um, TRLs do not penalize or criminalize individuals for attempting to purchase tobacco products, including flavors, but they do hold retailers accountable for selling. Uh, nine jurisdictions, including San Diego County, have adopted TRLs to help enforce the law and to protect kids. So I've brought you some tools, and we are here to support you in taking these important steps for CNT. So I'll leave these with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That concludes our non-agenda public comment. Take us to public hearing. Uh, item number 10, which is a public hearing for a tentative parcel map TPM 2020-1 and development review permit DR 2020-1 for a residential subdivision consisting of four single-family dwelling units located at 8732 Prospect Avenue in the low-medium density residential R2 zone. The applicant is Palm Tree Investments. Michael? Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, the uh, 0.85 acre project site addressed as 8732 Prospect Avenue is located on the northwest corner of Prospect Avenue in our way, as delineated in yellow here in this aerial before you. Um, our way is a private access easement that traverses the easterly end of the subject property. The site is developed with a single family residence that is currently unoccupied and will be demolished. The site is within the R2 low medium density residential zone and is immediately surrounded on all sides by the R2 zone and development consisting of one and two story single family homes. Here is an existing view of the subject site looking northwest toward the site from the intersection of our way and Prospect Avenue. Here's a closer aerial view of the site with the boundaries of the subject parcel outlined in yellow. Here is a, the 25 foot wide portion of our way that crosses the easterly end of the subject property. Uh, the proposed tentative parcel map would subdivide the subject parcel into four single family residential lots as delineated here and the lots would range in size from 7,680 square feet to 9,550 square feet. Primary access to the lots would be provided by a new 45 foot wide vehicular access easement connected to our way, as shown here. As part of the tentative parcel map conditions of approval, uh, the project would also be required to make an irrevocable offer of dedication of 12 feet along prospect, the Prospect Avenue frontage. Uh, the lots as proposed would meet the development standards for the parcels, for parcels in the R2 zone, including minimum lot size, lot width, and lot depth. Here is the, the site plan of the proposed development showing in greater detail the uh, proposed improvements on the site. Uh, the four lots would be graded to create four pads that can each accommodate a single family residence. The homes would be set back at least 20 feet from the new property lines. Grading would be minimal as the lot is relatively flat. The new homes would gain access via a 26 foot shared driveway from our way consisting of permeable pavers. And the frontage along our way would be widened from 25 feet, which is the existing condition, to 26 feet uh, to meet the fire access standard. A six foot uh, masonry high um, 
wall would be constructed along Prospect Avenue, and Prospect Avenue would be improved with a landscape strip, curb, gutter, sidewalk, and pave out of Prospect Avenue. The homes would be delivered pre-landscaped around the perimeter of the site, um, as shown in the area here, uh, with drought-tolerant landscaping provided in the, in the front yards and, as I mentioned, along, around the perimeter of the site. Three retaining wall segments uh, would be provided, um, as shown here. Um, the retaining walls would uh, vary in height from, along our way from one to two and a half feet, and a retaining wall would be placed on lot two. That would be up to four feet in height. Um, each home would also include a six-foot a uh, wooden privacy fence enclosing, enclosing the private yard areas. The um, existing mailbox along our way, um, which is currently shared by all residents along our way, would be preserved at its existing location. Uh, the proposed homes would each consist of two stories with a maximum height of 25 feet 6 inches, which is under the 35 foot a height limit of the R2 uh, zone. The homes would range in size from approximately 2,338 square feet to 2,747 square feet. Each home would have a distinct facade in the Spanish colonial revival um, architectural style as shown here in this exhibit. The proposed homes would meet the density, height, lot coverage, and setback requirements of the R2 zone and the high quality design objectives of our general plan. The homes would be consistent with the development pattern in the area, which primarily consists of one and two story single family homes. As the proposed project is a tentative parcel map consisting of four parcels that is ex exempt per, uh, from CEQA pursuant to uh, section 15315 of the CEQA guidelines. At this time, staff would recommend that you open and close the public hearing, find the project exempt from CEQA, and approve the project by adopting the attached resolutions before you. The um, applicant has reviewed and accepted all project conditions and is present tonight to speak on behalf of the project. And this concludes staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We have five speaker slips on this. We'll hear the speakers first. First speaker I have is Keith Cobble or Cobble. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council Members, uh, Santee residents. Um, you know, I really don't have much to say. I, I, I wanted to hear other people first, actually, and it's funny that I got first uh, picked. Uh, but I did have some questions, and I don't know if you're going to answer them. I just want to propose them. Uh, my first question is, uh, is the parcel of land now, is our way... Um, do they pay property tax on our way? Does that property pay property tax on our way? Do they have the right, um, I don't know if I want to say the right. Is there access from, from our way legally uh, attached to the parcel of land? That would be the first thing. The reason I mention that is because we've had that road paved several times since I've lived there, and the previous owners never participated in that. So that's just my thinking that that, that they shouldn't have access to our way. Um, as I look at the map, I wonder how come they don't use Prospect Avenue as their uh, entry to go in and out of the, pros uh, of the property. Uh, proper, mostly because it's a Prospect address. Everyone that lives on our way, I think except for one resident, one of the first homes there is a Prospect address, but everyone else has an our way address. And I don't know that these houses will have an our way address or a uh, prospect address. Um, and another uh, thing that I'd like to question is, uh, my mind's going blank. Um, I wish I wasn't looking at that clock. <laughs> um, okay, so we just wrote the, the 
legal? I just primarily legally, do they have? Oh yeah, uh, do they have access to our way? And then the other concern is is that our way is a narrow road, and with the residents that live there now, when we have even just even one or two extra guests show up at our house, it's fairly congested there. If you're going to add four more houses and they're going to use our way as their overflow parking, uh, that's going to add additional congestion to that. That's a concern that I have. Um, my mind's blank, so that's all I can think of. Those are questions. I know you're not going to answer them, but I'd like you to answer them as you talk amongst yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next speaker I have is Beth Atawasi. Mr. and Madam City Council, I'm a resident of our way. In fact, my property is directly beside the lot in question. It's our understanding that the easement road of our way was designed for the purposes of benefiting those who live down our way, that that's what it was designated for decades ago. The subject property Use of it was always on Prospect Avenue. And I am shocked to see for the first time tonight that we now have a proposition to put four large homes with access solely from our way, when the driveway access has always been on Prospect. The road of our way, we understand, is only partially owned by the lot, in, the lot owner in question. And the other part of the road, down the road, is owned by the other property owners on the other side. There has been no attempt to gain any easement or cooperation or road maintenance agreement or anything. We have maintained that road ourselves throughout the decades. Many of the owner occupiers of the property have lived there for decades. Some are, res are tenants, but most of them have been there for a very long time, myself included. I understand that there's a 40-foot easement that's required for access to the uh, improvements that are involved, and I don't know that that exists right now. I believe that the access should be on the, on the property itself and not to encroach on the property owners surrounding it. There would be a density problem caused by this development. We have a tremendous parking issue on our way as it is. It's a humble, small private road. We also have utilities issues. My own utilities go down the road my, and I believe the other two original houses, there's three that were built back about 1961. The water access is right there at the corner. There's issues with sewer and water lines here. Also, Cox is our internet provider and our, our cable provider in the area. I've been trying to get another one out there. We do have poor connectivity there. So our, our properties would be burdened. The issues are self-imposed by creating, attempting to create four lots. It's our the final, the next speaker I have is Bill Howland. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and guests. I have a, uh, uh, two properties on our way, and we, uh, a lot of the concerns that she's brought up are the same concerns that I have. Uh, the traffic already on that road is, is uh, the, in passing of any other car comes, is very difficult to pass. Plus, the properties down below have a lot of water issues. The flow of water of, of uh, more of uh, hardscape and so forth coming off that into, under the property and I don't know, like to know how and what they're doing with the drainage of all the water because it drains all the way down the two parcels all the parcels below there which causes a lot of problems as far as surface water. Also at the, uh, I'd like to know again uh, over the years we've, re we've repaved the road, we've, we've maintained it uh, periodically and never had any cooperation or any uh, 
uh, anything from this particular parcel, which got, that would have been a prior owner, but um, that's been something that uh, has never been any participation on us, and we've shouldered the cost of resurfacing and, and putting the bumps and so forth in those roads. So uh, those are the main things I'm, I'm concerned with, and also the, all the other items that uh, she's brought up in the past. So thank you very much for uh, considering our, our uh, views. Thank you. Next speaker is Rebecca Kennedy. Um, I'm coming to you as a resident. I'm an original. Uh, excuse resident. me, you're going to need to get closer to the microphone. Oh. Just pull it up, pull over. Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> if you don't know, we, no one will be able to hear you. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> anyway, so I'm here as a resident of um, our way. My husband and I built our house there in 1978. I've lived in Santee for over 60 years. We've had the house on our way right where they want to put this access to these four homes in, right across from my home. Literally, I have, it's just, my husband and I had, my husband had a verbal agreement with the original owner there that, you know, we had this access, and it, that was for us. It wasn't for anyone else. And my property line actually goes to the fence line, and like what was presented about the water the Cox Cable, and many different things on our street are just extremely questionable, extremely questionable. And like I said, for a resident for being there since 1978, I've lived in Santee, like I said, for over 60 years. Been here, worked here, everything. And it's like what they are proposing with these four houses is very um, overwhelming to some of us residents that have been here for a while. Like we've said, we have had to take care of the, the uh, street ourselves. We pay for that. It's never been paid for through the city. It's always been paid for through the residents. And um, <clears throat> for what they want to take to put those four homes in is just, just overwhelming to us, extremely overwhelming to us, you know. And um, I just come to you as, you know, saying that, this is a concerning matter to us as living here for so many years and taking care of our residents and our families and our neighbors and everyone that lives within our little neighborhood. And um, I just hope and pray that we can come to some sort of... Sorry. It's all right. ...thing to keep it under control. Thank you. You know... But I thank you so much for your time, and I just, you know, pray that we can get this all underway. And, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Still got 32 seconds. Is <laughs> <laughs> that door? My uncle was a fireman here at Santee. He was the first fireman that retired from the city of Santee. <laughs> Harry Bell, yes, was my uncle. <laughs> yeah, yes. And yes, he has, I have his placard. <laughs> like I said, we've been here in Santee for a long time. Family. Thank you. What is it? The treacherous driveway. Going up. Yeah, the treacherous, yes. I'm trying to get out under prospect. Yeah, yes, that's dangerous. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, the Thank final you. speaker I have is Lacey Kennedy Cornejo. I need you to put a speaker slip, slip in for the baby. <laughs> she just turned one. <laughs> um, hello, City Council and Mayor. Sorry. Um, my name is Lacey Kennedy. I am the daughter of Rebecca Kennedy. My family owns the second home on our way. Like mother, daughter, you have to get next to the microphone. Oh, sorry. To pull it on over. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's go ahead and restart. Please. Thank you. Okay. Once again, my name is Lacey Kennedy. We are the owners of the second home on our way. Um, 
I was born and raised in the home. I'm 43 years old. My children now occupy the home with myself and my husband. Um, from what we've always understood, there was no access from our way to that lot. It's always been Prospect Avenue. I grew up with the children that lived in that home. It's always been that home. Entrance on Prospect, adding that burden to our private drive. My home shows different boundary lines to what um, this gentleman came to the site today and discussed with us. None of the residents had viewed or seen any of this prior. Actually, some. Can I actually ask all the residents of our way and actually, the surrounding? You, you need can to they stand? Us, Lacey. Oh, I'm sorry. Can they just stand so I can show you guys how many people? Well, we might be able to ask that question later. Oh, gotcha. Okay, but. We're here. That all these people are here just with the concern. There's over 19 homes already that are accessing our way. And one of them turns into a single lane. Trash trucks come, our cable lines, power lines are getting knocked down. Cox Cable's telling us they can't facilitate faster service. Our, some, we have residents that are small businesses, children on homeschool. The roads would have to be dug up. All of these crazy things have to happen in order for these four homes to be built. Not only does it affect the traffic, there's already a parking issue. There is no parking. Like I said, it's a single lane. Um, we, would, we would really like there to be a further review of our title and our paperwork that, like I said, might show different boundaries than what we were displayed today, um, as well as there's many neighbors that th if there's four two-story houses, they have no view. There's homes that are literally going to be boxed in. That, that presentation doesn't show the rest of the neighborhood. You know, Our home is directly across from it, so it's definitely a burden to us. But the other homes, there's a lot of serious concerns where there's going to be multiple homes that have the KB home development, as well as these other new proposed developments. It's already a problem. It's already a safety concern. It's already a safety concern. Um, with, with the children, there's a home daycare business that's two houses down. Um, there's just so many concerns as to why the access has to be from our way, which we've always paid and maintained as private residents, um, as well as why the entrance can't be from Prospect Avenue. It had to do with lot size and what they could fit in the property. And I've discussed that with the- Great, well, thank you, Lacey. Thank you. That's all of them, right? All right. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go uh, first on some questions here. Michael, you're gonna need to come up. And um, can you bring up the slide that shows the uh, four properties, and actually the one that shows the, uh, the uh, that, that one right there. Thank you. So I, I guess I would ask, ask the question also, oh, what is it about this lot, the four lots being broken up that would require that access from our way instead of prospect? Project proponent, um, in order to try to accommodate the four lots, needed access from our way. And, the, and also because Prospect Avenue is a collector roadway with a, with a high speed of traffic, our preference as well is to limit new driveways along our way. Okay, so the thing is that we have a lot of houses down there that have access right off of Prospect that have been there since before incorporation. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I, we're gonna get to some of these questions that you had, uh, so I do need to have it quiet. Thank you very much, appreciate it. So, um, so I mean, obviously I'm not an engineer, I'm not a planner. Uh, if I look at that lot, uh, there's questions about how things could be done maybe a little bit differently. Um, and and uh, maybe the answer would come from the developer uh, because when you say um, well the developer uh, looked at it and they to make it work had to put it there well 
I guess the question is, why does it have to be like that to make it work? So I don't know if you could answer that. Or I think, so in order to meet our minimum lot depth and lot width requirements, um, they would have to configure it in this fashion. Otherwise, they may not be able to meet those minimum requirements from, our, from the R2 zone. So I think that they created this configuration in order to maximize the number of lots on the property. Okay. So currently, um, our way is 25 feet, you said. It's going to be made uh, bigger to 26 feet? Yeah, so there'll be a, a little sliver, a, a one-foot sliver along their portion of our way um, that would be paved out. Um, they would also put in curb and, uh, curb and gutter here. And no sidewalk, it'd be a, a, because there's existing infrastructure there that serves the other properties behind this one along our way, um, they would put, uh, they wouldn't place permanent improvements like a sidewalk. It would be a DG walkway. Um, as this would be a DG walkway that would connect the sidewalk from Prospect to okay. um, the new homes here. All right. So then there will be no de uh, dedication there, irrevocable? Revocable Not to the city because it's a private drive. There'd be an additional easement, a flowage easement, and that additional foot along our way for the additional pave out. Okay, so here's what I'm getting to, though, is that uh, we're going to leave that a private street. Yes. And uh, we're putting in four new homes that uh, are the residents that live there will be using. And... Um, they're causing wear and tear. What is their obligation to maintain that road then? They're required by the conditions of approval and by the establishment of the HOA to maintain their portion of the roadway. So they would have to enter into an agreement with the existing uh, folks that live in there, property owners. Well, as to the remainder of, the, of our way, they would have to have a, a private agreement as currently exists with all the other neighbors who share our way. There's no um, recorded uh, maintenance agreement for the roadway because it predates um, the California Subdivision Map Act, the creation of these parcels. That doesn't no. preclude them from creating one, though, right? They could each, they would each individually have to enter into that private agreement. That, that's where I'm getting to because I, I think it's, it was a good question about you know, we've been paying for this for years, and now we have wear and tear coming to the neighborhood. What is their obligation? Um, was How come that couldn't be widened any more than just the extra foot? So they were just meaning our fire requirement of 26 feet, and that's why they were, and that just the fire marshal, that it was reviewed and approved by the fire, fire marshal as proposed for fire access. So now you have that new property line uh, back of, was it 15 feet um, back of the curb is uh, actually the property line, or where's that at now for this? So it would be uh, 26 feet from the curb to property line. So then... No, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, right. Well, I, where I'm getting at is that it seems to me like they could have taken more of that uh, lot and um, actually put in curb gutter and sidewalk on that side so that people could actually park against it. And that would also widen the road so that people can get in and out. Um, just a thought. Um, and then also um, the water issues that were um, talked about and the drainage uh, there any, what, what are we doing here for storm drains and connecting and all that kind of stuff? Um, I'll just give a, a general overview and maybe um, Carl, our city I can I can actually weigh in on that, Michael. So they're actually going to be conditioned with final improvement plans to submit a drainage study. Currently, everything in this whole area, there's no there's no drainage pipes. Everything sheet flows. This was all developed prior, you know, prior to Subdivision Map Act, prior to drainage law. It meanders and follows the original path of flow. They're not proposing changing that, but they will be required to submit a drainage study with the final improvement plans, and we'll evaluate it at that time. 
I think tentatively they're planning to continue the drainage in the exact same pattern that exists today. And they're adding very minimal impervious area because they're putting uh, permeable pavers and all that. So it's not really going to increase very minim minimal increase of drainage, if any, with impervious area. So we'll certainly evaluate there at that during final plans. It just seems to me we should have seen that drainage plan before we got this far. Um, okay, that's all I have. Who, uh, Laura? Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> So I, I wrote down a lot of similar notes, but um, is it accurate that there there possibly could be discrepancy in title and property lines? Or um, since our, it's such an old property? I would defer that to our city engineer. It has been, been reviewed we, by our They actually division. had a did a title report and a title search on it. And I would point out there's also a 25-foot easement on the other side of our way on those three properties that was recorded in 1977. So in front of the houses, a few of those individuals, at least on the title report we have and we've reviewed and looked at, there's actually another 25 foot easement on the other side that provides access exclusively for those three properties, the way it's written. Again, all prior to subdivision map acts, so they're kind of written kind of oddly and differently, not typically what we'd see today. So it's not really right away, and, and you know it's kind of like a, a fence line between you and your neighbor today. It's a shared agreement. You either agree to replace it together or not. It's kind of along those lines. That's how the private streets are kind of handled. Um, it's a private arrangement between those homeowners. It's not built to public street standards. We don't accept it until it's built to public street standards because it's just too costly for us to maintain like we would do a new subdivision. So that's why we're not requesting curb gutter sidewalk and all those type of improvements we normally see with a subdivision because it is a private street, not owned and maintained by the city. Uh, another comment I have is, you know, to me, it just doesn't make sense to have a, a new house and new development and all this beautiful landscaping and um, have it finally some more sidewalk on Prospect Avenue. But then if the entrance... You know, people would walk from their homes to Prospect, and there's no sidewalk there. You know, and, I, and DG to me is not the right solution for something like that. Um, I understand. You know, I have a better understanding now, due to the age of the road and how these agreements happened. You know, in in, in the '60s or '70s, it's it's very different from what we do today. But you know, my home is was built in 1959 in Santee, so very old, and. Uh, on the one side, you know, we, we are tasked to build homes, and we can't deny that. Um, and so when I hear, I, I know that if you've lived somewhere a long time and you haven't had neighbors at close at all, it's like, oh, my gosh. Uh, I have a big backyard, too, right? I have some space, but right behind my home, they can build R7, which R2 is four, you know, R7 is a lot more density right behind my home. And... Uh, you know, and I, I struggle with that as well. You know, just I know that there will be several stories, not just a two-story home, not a single-family home, one day behind my home that I've lived in for a very, very long time. So um, that doesn't uh, – but, but ours was a development, and the city does maintain our streets, and we do have sidewalks and all those kinds of things. So it is different from your situation. I, I haven't been out there, but it, it's – you know – to hear that some people contribute to maintaining the road and some people don't, that's troublesome too. And then if new people come in, I don't know how that agreement works, but that just doesn't, I wouldn't have confidence in that, that they're going to fork over their fair share to pay for the our way improvements where these people have lived there a long time and they're dedicated to doing that. Um, so I'm uncomfortable with that part. Um, how many parking, are there, two, is, are there all two car garages? Yes. Uh, each home would have a two-car garage. And then on and, the little uh, access, you know, the, the frontage paver road, is there parking there? Yes, there would be a 20-foot a deep driveway um, in front of each garage that could accommodate two additional vehicles. So two in the garage, which that doesn't happen, you know, and then two in front of it. <laughs> and uh, no parking. You can't see what I'm looking at, but just in that strip once you get in there. No parking and no sidewalk um, along the road where it sounds like a lot of other people already park. Um, I, I mean, technically it meets our parking standards, but it, it sounds like just the rest of that drive, 
there's a lot. It's 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 just troublesome for me. Um, right down. So, and that's a pre-existing condition. So I, what I, I'm trying to say, like, to say that nothing can't be built there ever, that's not realistic. But we're, we would want to try to work with you all to see what, you know, works as best as can be for everybody. Um, and then I'll just add a little uh, comment, since I am a park director and Wi-Fi access is a big, big issue down, it sounds like, where you live. There is a, a, a system called Starlink that you could research in, in lieu of Cox Cable, and uh, it goes on top of your roof. And um, it's satellite cable, and it's very fast and very reliable, so something to look at in your community. Um, those are my questions for now. You, I'm sorry, the comment period is over. Thank you. Rob, do you want to go? Yeah. So there, there's been no private road maintenance agreement on this property recorded at, at any time thus far. Uh, pardon? The uh, private road maintenance agreement. No, there's no private road maintenance agreement recorded. Okay, and on we the title. are we requiring that for this section of the road that there is now a rec a recorded maintenance agreement? For their section, it would be actually a condition of approval to have a part of the CCNRs of the. Okay. So it would be recorded. So that section from into perpetuity will be required to be maintained. Yes, by absolutely. If they don't do it. It's something that city can come in and enforce as lean against the property taxes at a later time. Yes, that's correct, sir. Okay. Um, did I hear, I think it was Carl, did I hear you correctly that on the, and I'm getting lost in direction, on the, on our way right here that, that, that this is, represents currently, actually, can you go to slide number, I think it's three? There you go. The section in blue. Well, there you go, there you go. That, that's good? currently 25 feet wide. The, the existing easement from the title report um, is indicated as 25 feet. That section in blue right there is that 25 section, feet wide. And then I also so mentioned opposite a, to the east for the benefit of those three properties. There's another 25 there's feet. There's another 25 feet. It's currently being, it's just got it's trees not on it. It's, it's, yeah, so that's, there, there is an easement there. Yeah, and it's it's, more it's just based on the nature of the way it all developed because you know how flag lots work. They needed to provide access for the right side and the left side, and that's, I mean, and again, strictly off title report. Okay. Um, so there is actually, it had the potential, of, it was supposed to be 50 feet. It's just this, on the other side, it got Again, it is not a simple, without getting into details, it's not as simple as that because it's only granted to certain lots and certain individuals. We don't do it that way anymore. At the time, the right. owners, it was granted to the individual. Then you get in, I'm not an attorney, so I wouldn't venture to guess how those are conveyed and, and dealt with. So, but there was a dedicated and it's represented on title a 25 foot easement um, for the benefit of three lots. And so these, and this, this section that we're referring to right here, this 100% of that in blue is part and parcel of the original. It's, it's actually owned in fee by that, okay. by this property with okay. an easement granted for access to people behind them. With with an easement yes. granting access. Okay. Um, uh, that's already been answered. Well, so will there be a new utility drop being brought to the property line? Um, that'll be in final engineering, but I can say there's also a utility easement on our way on this exact same 25 feet sewer water and everything else is on is has an easement for that and they are all served perpendicular from that as well and assuming when final design they would be served perpendicular from our way as well from those existing services so the the overhead the electrical is served overhead from a, a SDG&E power line that's a again another odd easement it's a single line easement with no defined width that's the way they did it to every house okay. but the underground sewer water those are all served underground with a pottery dam easement on our way. Oh my I'm going to have to ask you not to make comments. The um, so the big, I mean, the biggest concern I have, frankly, is drainage con drainage concerns, and it's because of what we've we've dealt with here in the past. Um, when you don't have undergrounding of the drainage uh, or proper flow, you can you can utilize natural berms and things of that nature from the onset, but 
somebody decides they move in there, they don't like having a natural berm and they want to level out their backyard or front yard and they level that out and it completely throws off the the watershed. That, that would be a code compliance issue we would deal with at that time. I mean, that's not uncommon. You're, you're correct. That yeah. does happen. <laughs> um, I would say currently the pattern of drainage indicated, the best of our knowledge, without final plans, it sheet flows, it finds its way to the northeast corner of the property and then drains down our way like pretty much every property on here does. They meander and follow and then go to the north all the way to Mission Gorge Road, kind of meandering through backyards, side yards. It's kind of a, it just followed the natural drainage pattern that existed prior to any homes being developed out there. And there's no way to flow those or to level that so that it goes down towards Prospect where there's actual... No, because it's actually lower than Prospect Avenue. This parcel is. Okay, I'm good right now. That's actually where I was going to not necessarily start, but I had that in my notes here too, Carl. So part of the issue, let's start with the driveway. Is the driveway currently off a of prospect for that existing home? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what I see going on here is an elevation issue. So what is the difference between the pad level at parcel two or parcel one, either one, and the street? Because that's part of the reason it's, why he's taking it's the It's not very much because the entire grading is less than 300 cubic yards okay. for the whole lot. It's very flat. But it is lower, and it, and it tends to go, the, the grade goes to the north, lower than Prospect Avenue. You mentioned the utilities, and I had the same question. Was the, the water and the sewer both coming off ROA, but where is the electric coming from? It's overhead served from a power line that actually follows right along parcels one and parcel two on the yellow line. Okay. There's an overhead power line and an easement for sdg &E there. You see a shadow for a pole. Is that an actual pole there? Yeah, there's actually a pole right on the corner of the property there. So it will be undergrounded from that for those houses or still going to be overhead? They'll stay overhead because that's not, there's no nexus to underground for the uh, offsite houses. Okay. Real, real quick, is, is there a secondary pole? Um, there's a secondary pole in the middle of the lot between yeah. parcels one parcel and parcel one and two. two. That essentially serves homes to the south. Yeah. I, I'm thinking of a secondary pole that, uh, a pole that would uh, go that would feed from northbound on our way. I mean, yeah, there's there's multiple series of poles I think along our way that go service all 19 lots along that that stretch. They're fairly kind of meanders. They're fairly I, far apart. Yeah, two poles. Carl, the the drainage coming off a of prospect where it says Prospect Avenue with the R is mm -hmm. there's some kind of inlet there or something. Where where does that go? Um, that, the that's yard. the same. It fought, kind of finds its path and it finds its way over to Mission Gorge Road through backyards and side yards traditionally. So there's no... There's, there's no, there's no drainage like easements, no drainage structures, no facilities at all for drainage anywhere in this whole as these subdivided and were built. The, the permeable surface that, that's going in is obviously to maintain the water on property. All right, on, on the parcels. That's part of the reason. Yeah, the, the point of Hydromod, you know, we're, we, they cannot increase the flow leaving the property. So they will be providing stormwater features to retain and not release more water. Do you expect other things other than the permeable, sur permeable surface, like a basins or any other? Uh, yeah, there's going to be some features. basins along our way. They have proposed them. We don't have final design on them, but they're conditioned in the conditions of approval. They're conditioned to study those and build them to our satisfaction to, rip, so that the flow is not increased. Yeah, when you're talking at drainage, you can kind of see on the northeast corner there's riprap and a basin kind of preliminary laid out that Michael's identifying there. That's the anticipated location of the retention, so to speak, and stormwater feature. I got a history question if you <laughs> maybe have it. So you, you talked about 1977 title report when these other homes across the street were, you know, uh, it's it's actually valor. convoluted. I, I can read you what it actually says. It's well, brief. Let me, just ask my, let me ask my question, and maybe you can go from there. So, um, so on the, the tentative parcel map, it basically says an existing 25-foot 
offset private access easement per deed recorded June 25th, 2019 as instrument to 2019 blah, blah, blah of official record and deed recorded August 26th, 1977 for these three lots, which are APN 383-11244, or it's for the benefit through lot 383, which is the very corner, to the next two lots for their benefit, so that those three lots will have access off Prospect Avenue. That's the best I can ascertain based off the title report what the intent so, was. Well, so those three lots you're referring to, and I'm guessing a few other ones behind that, they were one larger parcel at one time. They were. So they were, right? And so what are those, what size are those parcels today, those current homes, roughly? 10, 12,000 square feet? They're yeah, a little I, larger than these, so. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't know specifically, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, I just, I'm. They are larger than these, I'm typically. trying to look at, you know, where things have gone. I mean, these were all larger parcels at one time. They all have been carved up and cut down to smaller parcels to accommodate more homes. You know, the problem they were dealing with is there's private road, ultimately. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, this out. goes all the way back to the 1898 map. Rancho subdivision map, and it was one parcel, then it got subdivided, and, and this has happened multiple times throughout the years. It, um, and prior to the Subdivision Map Act, there were no requirements and conditions for drainage and those kinds of things. That's why it exists that way today. I don't know if we need to develop here or not, but Michael, you, you made a comment, and, and that was your opinion here, about why the lots were carved the way they were. Um, it appears to me, and maybe you can tell me, is the, what is the length of this lot? Because it appears to be longer in depth than it is wider. Uh, let me go back to the lot What I can here. see on the tenants and parcel map, I, it's hard to see, but it looks like 198 feet one way and 192 and a half the other way. Here are the, yeah, uh, okay, I got it right. Dimensions. <laughs> I see it on so, this, I can't see it on paper. 200 by 200. Yeah. So it's actually deeper than it is wider. So what it's going is put, you, you flip this around, you put the road off the other direction, you, you're, the lots are deeper than they are wider. I mean, it, it can be cut. You have a bowling alley. Yeah, basically. I mean, it can be cut any which different way. So I don't know if that's a, if that was a reason. Is it, is it a setback issue, the depth of it? Is it the utilities? Is it the, the elevation change? The, I mean, anybody have a, <laughs> a thought? I know that originally when they, when they tried to configure the lots with access from Prospect, it was difficult to meet the setbacks of the homes and also mm -hmm. the lot dimension requirements and the access and the grade difference because uh, the differential is from big Prospect rather than from the uh, side access to our way. So that effort was exhausted? Yes. It was looked at, okay. It never worked? It was, he's, he's saying it was, it was looked at. What he's getting to. I'm not sure. 10 feet difference. That's all I got right now. A real quick question, though, is um, interesting sizes of parcels because an average par pad right now in Santee is about 6,000 square feet, right? Yes, that's the minimum lot size for the R2 zone. Right. 6,000 square feet. I mean, there's, I think there's ways of probably cutting this down so that um, you could get closer to even a 6,000 square foot. Because so, some of it looks even like it's unused. And one of my concerns is that uh, the one where you show the uh, vegetation that goes around and it's going to be outside of a fenced yard of those homes, who takes care of that? Who maintains that? And then, uh, I hate to say it, but it is, what's the access to it? Because now I'm worried about, you know, Homeless people climb the back of a, you know, fenced in and and a walled in area, and now we have fire problems, we have trash problems, and rat problems, and other things of that nature. Whereas if it's left open or the fence line goes to the property line, then you have property owners then that are maintaining that. So we're requiring them to establish an HOA to maintain uh, that common landscaping. Hmm. Uh, Ron, did you have anything? No, we, yeah. were you done with this? Well, first of all, I think it's obvious that we're not real happy with this project. Um, it's it's uh, it's just it's a mess, pure and simple. 
Um, go back to the next slide back where you got the picture of it. Uh, keep going. Keep going. I want to see the actual. The tentative map. Yeah, that thing. So, again, the 9,000 square feet, and this is kind of what the mayor was saying. This is where I was going to go with it, too. You're going to tell me you can't come up with another 15 foot, put a sidewalk in and a uh, walking path and uh, and kind of clean it up. And you're going to tell me you can't take that 7,600 and put in a, uh, a better uh, uh, recovery area for water. Uh, it just... It doesn't. This is Walker Trails when we first started all over again. I just see this being a problem, and it just isn't making any sense to me. If these people are going to come in here and do this, they need to be part of the community. They're just wanting to slap up four houses here and uh, basically uh, make it their way. Um, I don't. It's like they can just name it their way now rather than our way. Um, so basically, it's it's you turn the the little left turn in there. I still think they could come off prospect, but I won't argue that part. I would not finish this project without an agreement where they're going to fix that road because they're SOL if they say, yep, eh, we're not interested. And then they're buying a road. Then the, the t people on our way are buying a road. And I just, the water issue bothers me. The sidewalks bother me. The cable bothers me. You know, you have a major housing development right next door. You're gonna, you can't tell, you can't run electrical and from next door over there. Uh, it's just, the whole thing makes no sense to me. Somebody's going to have to dig a trench, and somebody's going to have to put some cable in there, and somebody's going to have to put some, some electrical in there, because we have the underground right now. We're trying to underground the whole city, but yet let's throw up four houses here with the, the wired electrical. You know, it just the whole thing doesn't make any sense. We're being too nice to this guy. He wants to build these houses, you can build them, but we got to put some rules and regulations on these things. So that would be my suggestion. I'm a, I'm a no vote on this. Sorry. Is, is the uh, developer here, you said? I thought. Yeah, I, I'd like for you to come up, and I don't know if you have a... She's not the developer, is she? What? Oh, she? Okay. Okay, come on up. We'll have just have you put in the speaker slip later. She did. She did. Oh. She told me I was too late. <laughs> okay, well, I'm calling you up. Can she put her name in? All yeah, we, we'll, we already have your stuff. Just for the record, please say your yeah. name. So my name is Trisha Estrada. I'm not a huge developer, as you can see. I well, understand that. You know, I'm a, a, a private party that purchased the lot that, you know, with the hopes to develop the four houses that eventually we keep long term. My kids will have houses here. My son goes to Champion Gymnastics. You know, we've been here in the community for a while. So for some of the questions that have been going on, we would love to go off prospect. Um, you know, Michael, I just met him now. I've been working with the city for the last two and a half years, and there's been a lot of back and forth of what I can and cannot do with this lot. So I've been trying to comply with every city regulation that has kind of been informed. You need to keep up with the Sorry. microphone. So I've been trying to comply with all of the different city regulations based on, you know, the rules and, and um, requirements that have been laid on the parcel. So if I could go through Prospect, that was my number one goal. I was told I couldn't. So because our way, that 25 feet easement, is part of our property, that's where I was restricted to have access to. Now, regarding parking, it is our intention to have the 26-foot wide private road that goes into those four houses. So that will also provide more parking for our four, which shouldn't have an off spill. It shouldn't touch anywhere of our way. But again, if the communication is open to come off prospect, I would be willing to talk to that about it. You know what? Uh, I think we need to send it back and have them uh, relook at it. Uh, but is there, an, is there an agreement on that? Okay. Um, Sean, how, how can we do that um, with an action? Uh, you can, I don't know if you need to take an action. I mean, you can just say, listen, we want to direct staff to look at these issues and work with the community, bring it back, um, and do it, do it that way. If you want to give specific direction, obviously you can, you can and should do that. Um, I don't think you need to formalize it in a, in a motion, though. Okay. Well, then we'll just give it direction staff. I, we would like to probably hear more about what you can maybe do um, to get a Prospect Avenue entrance. Um, and also, 
I got to tell you, I drive by this several times a day because I just live down the street. And I'd love to see this develop because, you know, this is a haven for, you know, people to come to. You probably had to clean for, it out more well, than once. Well, for three years, we've continued to call the sheriff because we have looting and yeah. we have homeless people and right. we're trying to keep them out as much as possible. So I'd love to be able to improve the project. I mean, that is the goal. And actually, I, I welcome the neighbors. Unfortunately, with COVID, I haven't been able to meet them all. Because, of course, we should maintain, you know, if we had an R-way access, absolutely, it would be a responsibility. You need, well, it's, need to. Sorry. It's, it's yes, so R-way, it is part of the parcel that I purchased. So okay. the 25 foot. So I am happy Rem to. Remind me your name again. Trisha Estrada. Trisha. Yes. We're going to send this back to staff to have another look at it and uh, to work on it. Um, I don't expect this to take another two years. <laughs> I hope not. And uh, because I don't want anybody to go broke while they're doing this. And uh, but uh, let's let's work on something that is much more um, collaborative and acceptable to the community. I think that would be great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, let's talk later. No. 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 We'll talk about it afterwards. Talk yeah. about a typo. We'll okay. There's two parcel twos. <laughs> All right, then. All right, that takes us to item number 11, which is new business, Introdu introduction and first reading of an ordinance to add section 7.20.100 to the Santee Municipal Code to protect the San Diego River Corridor. And who's given this one? Uh, mayor, um, I'm do the presentation. So, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members, um, this item is the recommended introduction and first reading of an ordinance to protect the San Diego River corridor. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the San Diego River corridor has always been an important part of the city and the city's uh, long-term planning. Uh, most recently, in March of 2021, the City Council reaffirm the importance of this corridor um, by s establishing um, a policy goal of creating a um, San Diego River area safety plan uh, to ad address conditions in the river. Um, since the establishment of that uh, goal, uh, multiple actions have uh, taken place both with the City Council and with staff, uh, including but not limited to declaring various um, states of emergency in the river so that um, staff could expedite work to um, clear brush and do other fire suppression work. Um, council has also uh, used funding to establish relationships with a variety of nonprofits to help address conditions in the river. The city manager has established a, a working group that is uh, focused on conditions in the river. So a lot has occurred already to implement the policy goal uh, of creating a safe, clean, and, and healthy habitat for all users of the river. And today is a, another step in that direction through the um, consideration of, of an ordinance uh, that I'll talk about in more detail. Uh, next slide, please. So as you know, and, and the community is well aware, the river corridor is a very valuable uh, community resource, not only to city residents, but it's a draw to people from outside the city who come to experience uh, the trails and, and other amenities. Um, but the, the river corridor is vulnerable to um, the effects of human uh, actions. Um, so obviously there's issues with fire, there's issues with uh, flooding where there's trash, debris, and other human created impediments that affect the flow of water in the river and can exacerbate uh, flooding particularly in times like we're experiencing now where we have uh, potentially heavy rains, and, and that's a very dangerous condition. Um, there are also water pollution issues where uh, the presence of people within the river uh, leads to the presence of bacteria. Um, there, are, there are metals that are uh, left and, and things like batteries and, and other things that are left within the river that are harmful, and then again, trash, which is a, both a, a pollutant and also an impediment uh, for flooding. And then the, the habitat in the area is very sensitive, and so the presence of human humans on a regular basis that's unmanaged can create uh, problems for that habitat. So next slide, please. 
Um, so in addition to those uh, issues, I want to kind of focus a little more on, on fire, which I know is something that the council is acutely aware of. Um, I know many of you have uh, you know, visited the river when there are fires within the river and, and, and know the problems that are, are created there. But um, you know, basically, this habitat is, is very susceptible to fires. Our area, of course, is very susceptible to fires. Um, there's evidence in the proposed ordinance that you know, most of the wildfires, 85% is the number that's in the ordinance, are human created. Um, and so when you have people living in a condition in a place that can quickly burn, you have um, a problem. And uh, if you go to the next slide, we have experienced that problem. And, and really in the last two plus years, it's been very, very bad. Uh, this is a map that uh, generally shows the river corridor and um, over 200 fires that have been reported in the, within the river corridor. Now, these maps where these dots are are actually where the um, reports of the fire occurred, but you can see they're all congregated within the, the river corridor, both the main stem of the San Diego River and then also Forester Creek area. Um, and through the work of your fire department and the sheriff and, and others, Thus far, the, the, those uh, fires have been able to be quickly contained, but um, I know many of you have experienced the danger that's presented by these fires, and, um, and there have been you know, burns that have gone all the way up to, to homes, uh, edges of homes, and I think a previous workshop, we've seen pictures of the, the flames you know, right next to homes, and so obviously this is a, a major issue that needs to be addressed. Next slide. So uh, in collaboration with uh, the city manager's office, with the fire department, with the sheriff, with DDS and other um, uh, staff, um, we've developed an ordinance that really tries to focus on the root causes of the problems that exist in the, in the river. Um, and they're really, again, uh, focused on the specific activities that create the problems. And so the proposed ordinance would address uh, the fire issue, the flooding issue, water quality, and issues with regard to habitat. Uh, the f there, are, there were specific prohibitions in the ordinance. The first two really relate to fire. So using an ignition source within the, the river, uh, which could cause or with the intent to cause a fire, uh, would be prohibited. So that would be a, a misdemeanor. It would also be subject to immediate abatement. Uh, similarly, um, we want to get to the, just the fact that people have ignition sources and are in that area uh, on a regular basis, and so there would be a prohibition uh, for using or having um, an ignition source uh, when you're engaged in certain activities within the river corridor. Similarly, um, you know, the, a major problem, as I mentioned, is that people are present in the river and that uh, leaves debris and other material that changes the flow of the river and increases flooding. And so being in the river area uh, and causing those activities to occur that change the flow or could change the flow of the water within the system would be a prohibited activity. Similarly, um, discharging or, or you know, causing to exist pollutants or other waste within the river would be a prohibitive activity. And then also activities uh, that would harm species or destroy critical habitat would be uh, prohibited. So again, we've really tried to focus on the root causes of the problem, and uh, we've worked with the sheriff in terms of being able to cite and enforce for these things, and so we're, we're very comfortable in, in recommending these um, prohibitions to you. If you go to the next slide, um, in addition to making the activities very specific and targeted, the area that we um, that these activities are prohibited within is also very specific, and we work closely with um, with DDS uh, to um, identify the specific parcels uh, that would be covered by this ordinance. And so, in the ordinance itself, those areas are identified. And then there's an illustrative map. Here's the the western part of the main stem of the San Diego River. If you go to the next slide. That's the middle area, and then the next slide, that's the, um, the eastern portion, and then uh, the final slide is the Forster Creek area. So again, um, very targeted on the areas where we're experiencing these problems and very targeted to the activities 
um, that would be prohibited. So if we go to the next slide. Next slide. Um, so um, our recommendation is for you to introduce and conduct the first reading of the proposed ordinance to set the ordinance for a second reading on the January 25th, 2023. And then um, there are uh, findings within the ordinance that it, uh, the activity is either not subject to CEQA or it is subject to a specific exemption, including exemptions related to um, preventing uh, fires and, and fire mitigation activities. Um, one final note, um, if, if the council is supportive of this effort, once the uh, ordinance is in place, we'll be working closely with the sheriff's department um, to uh, develop a, a process where we'll, we'll actively and aggressively enforce the ordinance. Um, you know, we're trying to time this so that we can get out in front of the next dry season where we're, you know, going to start experiencing fire, fires. We're getting plenty of rain, which is great, but as, as you know, that just heightens the, the fire risk in the future. Uh, so we want to be very um, progressive and, and uh, get out in front of these issues. So uh, we'll work with the sheriffs and, and others within the city, and then our office would be the ones that would be enforcing these. Um, so we, these aren't just things we would allow to go to the court and sit on the DA's desk. These are things that we would enforce ourselves. And then, um, as I mentioned, within the ordinance, there is uh, there are times when we uh, the, the fire department uh, identifies a very specific immediate risk. Um, and so under the new ordinance, we would have the ability to declare that an emergency and abate immediately. So we wouldn't have to wait 72 hours to, um, you know, hope nothing happens. We would be able to address those conditions immediately. So Again, uh, that's our recommendation. We're uh, happy to answer questions. I know the, the fire chief has been deeply involved in this and, and um, has a lot of information, uh, so uh, he's available for questions as well as the city manager. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker slips? No speakers. Thank you. Juan? Are, do, are we going to need to budget any extra money for sheriffs to do this, or are you guys going to be able to? I know the answer is yes, but... Uh -huh. <laughs> but you, could you handle the extra? Yeah, so we would. It would be similar to to what we have now, where as available, we have um, special details of deputies that that patrol the riverbed. Okay. Um, my, but, my my concern there is as available. Would would could we get a special detail going maybe or something? I, I, well, we currently have special yeah. details in okay. forms of in, in the form of homeless outreach that right. go down there on a regular basis, and obviously we would continue that. Okay. Um, and and continue the extra patrols of the riverbed that we currently have going on. Okay. Yeah, council member, if I might, it's not really the lack of the staff and the, the, the sheriff's commitment and presence. It's really the lack of the legal tools to be able to cite and Correct. prosecute. And that's what we're adding with this action tonight. Correct. I just want, I just, if we're going to enforce, let's make sure and go in full, full force. Um, I think that's it. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. I like the idea. Thank you. Um, Dustin, comments? Uh, just actually to law enforcement, not so much. You know, um, Captain, you are comfortable with this? You've been in the you've been in this uh, task have, force and working with this throughout. I have. I'm very comfortable and supportive. This of it. gives you guys a lot more teeth to absolutely to do things that we've asked. <laughs> we, we can use all the teeth we can get because, quite frankly, sir, uh, we haven't had much legal teeth lately. Um, right. And so, anything that can give us more, uh, I'm all in favor of. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I do want to commend you know staff. This is something that we put as a council uh, priority two years ago in our in our last workshop and. You know, two years is a long time, but, you know, we finally got into to something. So I, again, just want to commend staff for, for getting there right now, and I'll second uh, Councilman Hall's motion. Thank you. Laura? I'm definitely very pleased to see this come forward. And as a resident that lives very close to this activity and has been frightened many times and evacuated my home with my neighbors, um, you know, uh, thank you all for working on this and being on the forefront of it. Um, other communities maybe are not as proactive as we are. And this is, like Council Member Trotter said, this is a top priority for all of us here. And I'm, I'm really, really excited that this is moving forward in tandem with um, Care Court because, as we've said, this is not, you know, these are not random fires, and our city attorney was 
very gentle in explaining how these things happen but, and what's causing these things. But we know what it is, right? And uh, um, <laughs> driving home last night uh, across Mass Park Bridge, there was a smoke alert, right? There was uh, the, the, the rigs were on, the, on Carlton Hills Boulevard going behind my house again, investigating some, something there. And when I looked over, you know, it wasn't just the, the smoke, and which was obviously a small fire, and it didn't spread, but, and, and luckily it was raining, too. Um, but there was, there's just a lot of debris. And as you can tell, I've been sick, so, you know, I, <laughs> I haven't been driving to work. I'm not sick, right? I just have a cough. Um, <laughs> I had that lingering cough. But I, I'm go- driving back to work now, going across the bridge daily now, and... Um, you know, I texted Marlene, I see a tire, I see a tagging, I see, it's, it's constant. We, we're, you know, as a council, working on this constantly, and um, this makes me very happy. It makes me very happy. So I just wanted to share that and keep up the great work, because it really does mean a lot. You know, this is public safety, um, highest, prior, highest priority right here. So thank you. Did you have anything? Yeah, I just want to kind of echo a couple of things, and that is you guys, uh, you've, you've really led the way, not just, not just uh, locally, but in the state with what you've put together here. I um, want to commend you for all the efforts. I know it wasn't, it wasn't done in a vacuum. I know it was a lot of work that was done to make this happen, um, a lot of research, and I, I see the wording and how the wording can be used properly, um, but while at the same time it's, it's appropriate wording, uh, you, you guys just did a bang up job on this, and thank you very much for for listening to our requests and uh, and for setting the standard that I have a feeling other cities will be utilizing moving forward based on what you have done. So thank you very much. I guess my only comments are uh, regarding some of the questions I have in, from the community members about uh, why don't you do something about the homeless living in the river bottom? They see the fires, they see the you know things going on. And up until now, we really have not had the ability to do a whole lot. Um, I've talked about this before, but uh, Martin versus uh, Boise, Idaho, was a case that went to the uh, Court of Appeals, Federal Court of Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and basically uh, the Supreme Court refused to hear it, which means it becomes at least law of the land for the, our area. And what it said is that we cannot move people along, along that are homeless, that are living on uh, pro- public property. And the reason why is because they have a right to be there. And um, essentially that if we do any enforcement action, it violates their uh, right against uh, cruel and unusual punishment. And that might sound silly for a lot of people because when a fire occurs, aren't they violating somebody else's right to cruel and unusual punishment, losing a home perhaps or something of that nature. So we challenged our uh, attorneys with uh, finding some way of looking at this in a manner that does not punish somebody for being homeless, but what it does is it gives us the ability to protect our communities. They can go anywhere else, they just can't stay there if they have ignition material in their property or if they continue to change the flow of the river. And I know I've been down there many times and I've seen things built up like little dams and that makes a big difference because it does uh, affect the environment. And those are the things that we want to address. So if you're homeless, you can go wherever the court says you can go. You just can't go there and be a nuisance where you're damaging things or causing fires and things of that nature. So I, too, want to say thank you very much. It's been a long time coming. Of course, we had to wait for some of the courts to rule before we could actually take any action. So maybe that's why it didn't seem like we acted really swiftly, but the courts never act very swiftly, so that slowed us down. So I have a motion, and I have a second. Please vote and lock in your vote. Motion carries unanimously. And that takes us to uh, new business, item number 12, which is a possible cancellation of a regular city council summer meeting. And the reason why we do this, I brought this forward, is because we generally choose a meeting so that staff and so council members can actually take a vacation with their family. 
And uh, so we have some proposed dates. And what did I do with that? Oh, here we go. They are uh, July 12, 26, and August 9th. Does anybody have a conflict or with anything or what they feel is the best time for them to be away? I have a preference of the 26th of July. 26th of July? I like it. Motion I'm, to approve. I'm, I'm good. Or do you need to make a motion? I don't know. Yeah, yes. Second. Okay, I have a motion that uh, identifies July 26th, 2023 as a uh, dark meeting for the city council. Please vote. We have any speaker slips on this? No speakers. Thank you. I, I have to ask. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, this takes us to item number 13, which is a resolution of the Community Development Commission successor agency approving the recognized obligation payment, also known as a ROPS schedule, for the period from July 1, 2023 to June 30, 2024. And uh, Motion Heather, to approve. Oh, well, I have a motion to approve. Second. I have a second. Are there any speaker slips? No speakers. Well, then let's just go ahead and call for the vote then. Good job, Heather. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. That takes us back to non-agenda public comment. Do we have any speaker slips? No, sir. Thank you very much. That takes us to city council reports. Ron. No. I don't have a report, but I have a request of staff to go out to... Um, the Mission Gorge Villa Mobile Home Park um, and make sure that the noise of the new development is being mitigated properly, uh, the development happening behind that. I, I know the residents had come before, gosh, it seems like almost a year ago, um, and, and expressed their concerns. And as a council, we said we would make sure that the developer expressed those concerns. So I got another email while I was out sick, and, and I haven't responded, but... Um, I'm just going to make the ask here that you go out and check it out. Thank you. I'll uh, go last. Yes. No, sir. Councilmember McNellis. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, so my concerns are raised again with regards to Sandag and making sure that our representation on Sandag stands strong with the other communities that are not going to be pushed around anymore and does everything possible to... I don't care if it's keeping a quorum from happening or whatever the case may be, from allowing Sandag to get that weighted vote at any by any means necessary. Uh, they're pushing hard yet again on burdening the taxpayers with the purchase of a of a parcel downtown that is known to be riddled with <laughs> environmental issues, environmental waste, um, and. As a, I, I mean, just personal opinion, I think it's just a favor to the city of San Diego to get it taken off their hands uh, in order to garner some sort of favor back for the city of San Diego to push forward with a vehicle mile travel tax. So, I mean, we there's a number of cities. In fact, now that there's no representation from a couple, uh, it looks like the city of Santee will be potentially the swing vote to stop a uh, quorum on occasion. And I want to make sure that we're standing strong with that and keeping Sandag from running amok with our tax dollars. And I want to make sure that the council agrees with me or I'm just the only one up here that is tilting at windmills. So I see a one nodding head, two nodding heads. He, he, he nodded. So, he's a representative. So. Well, he, he's... We've all, we all got it. We all got our marching orders on everything, and this is one where this. I, I don't know. We're, we're getting lots of phone calls and concerns about making sure Santee stands up and does what's right, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page of what what that actually means. And if not, then and you're not comfortable with that, then let's put somebody else there that will be comfortable with that. It's not a personal thing. This is just. 
we got to make sure this, this is our tax dollars and they're huge tax dollars. And we've been, we've been taken advantage of for too long. And I want to make sure that they don't, they're not allowed to do that anymore to the extent we possibly can. That doesn't mean that walking out or anything like that is going to solve everything, but it will drive more attention to it, get some more media from it, um, and maybe bring some light to what's really going on because current media coverage does not want to, they don't want to do anything about it. They don't want to, they don't want anybody to know about it. And everybody I've talked to that pays taxes in San Diego County is appalled at what's actually going on. We don't need more bicycle lanes on the freeways. We need lanes to drive on, on the freeways. That's my two cents. Great. Well, it just so happens the reason why I wanted to go last is because I wanted to talk about your favorite subject, Sandag. Thank you. <laughs> Great segue. Perfect. So um, this is a very interesting time. Uh, the uh, Sandag Board of Directors will be meeting on Friday. They will be choosing a new executive board. And uh, the way that works is that uh, proposals are made for folks to be in those positions. Chair, first vice chair, and second vice chair. Currently, the chair and the first vice chair are seated only with a weighted vote, which means that 15 cities in the county could say no to, let's say myself, four cities, four cities can say yes and win. Oh, yeah. well, no. plus the right, but there, there's multiple members there. Um, so anyways, um, and then the uh, second vice chair is a tally vote or a plurality vote only, unless they don't get the person that they want, and then they can say no by a weighted vote. And uh, this is where the discussion comes in about walking out and... Um, <laughs> taking away a quorum so that action can't be taken. And there's a lot of discussion about that going around right now and how that uh, can best play out. And um, this is not a uh, partisan issue. There are uh, Democrats and Republicans alike that are um, on the same page, say feel the same way about it. And... Um, the biggest problem with uh, what's happening now is uh, there's uh, only one city right now anointing and appointing everything that goes on in the city or the county of San Diego, and that's just not appropriate. Whether it's to buy a building that's in question of its uh, safety or it's uh, to take away all of the money for the um, freeways to make good on the promises that uh, came out in the past, or if it's to uh, build a $640 billion project, and I say that much because that's probably what it will cost by the time they get around to it. It's only about half that right now. And so uh, we have to, uh, you're right, take a very strong stand. We have to uh, make sure that we work together um, collaboratively, um, there's a group of uh, mayors uh, that have signed on to a letter to do away with um, the weighted vote in the way it is now. Can't get rid of it because it's actually state law, so you have to have it. But we can create a policy perhaps that allows us to not go directly from uh, no's or yeses to we'll continue the item until the next meeting so that we can collaborate on it and actually negotiate and have a resolution that is equitable to everybody. Uh, and, and so those are going to be some of the things that are discussed at our next meeting. And um, I would suggest that anybody wants to be there to hear what's going on and see the discussion. I'll just call it that. Uh, 9 o'clock on Friday morning, 401 B Street. And it's important for you to go there and tell people what you expect of them as your representatives. Because even though I represent the city of Santee, I do represent the county also. 
and uh, others forget that they also represent the rest of the county. And um, the way things are going, we will never have a voice again in East County, period, whether you live in um, Lemon Grove, Santee, La Mesa, El Cajon, um, Poway, and Del Mar won't even have a uh, voice any longer. And that's a very sad thing that uh, one city can be the dictator of an entire county. So I, I hear very clearly what you're saying, and I've been in probably 10 or 12 conversations in the last three weeks regarding all this. So we'll just have to wait and see how it goes. But I'll be there, and uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up on that? Um, unfortunately, I can't be there Friday. But on the 27th, and KUSI does report on, actually, other perspectives, so I, I like to hear some Sandag information from that source as well. Um, on the 27th, I think, is uh, Hassan Akrata's, is it a performance evaluation? What's happening on that one? I, I haven't seen that one yet, Okay. the, uh, the information on that. No. I think that's telling it's, too. I and think then, it's just an annual uh, mm, performance I think it was evaluation. requested. Yeah. Well, anyway, that should be very interesting. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think back to the very first time I met him. But it, you know, the five bold moves, the, the whole big vision, was already out there. And yep, we're doing this. And um, I, I, he didn't know me from anybody, but. I, we were at Grossmont College sat, standing on the rainy steps, uh, getting on a bus, so he could do his first tour ever of East County. He'd never even driven out here, yet he had a regional transportation plan, developed and ready to move forward. And, you know, I mean, this is back when uh, Supervisor Jacobs was on, yeah. on, on the county, county Board of Supervisors. And it was just very telling that his first... First time even putting eyes on the 52 or the 67 or the 94 was that day when the plan was already in his mind visionary and rubber stamped. Mm -hmm. So um, leaves a bad taste in my mouth, and he, him in particular, he's proven to be what we thought he would be. Um, so the, the problem, you the power. <laughs> <laughs> the problem you have is is there is no. East County part of that big vision, and or or North or, County, or North County. Or, I mean, and and that's where the real concern to me is. Is there's no, you know, you've seen it, I've seen it. Um, when they they were talking about jobs, you know, in 2050 the jobs are still over in La Jolla area, in Serrano Valley. They're not out here, and they they make there's no attempt to bring them out here. There's no attempt to run the trolleys out here. They want us to jump on a trolley go down to Old Town, and then go up to uh, Serrano Valley, and it takes two hours to do that. And frankly, I don't want to. Yeah. I live in a, sub, a suburb, and I'm not hopping on the trolley. And no matter what he says, I still remember what he said to me the very first day when I said, well, I don't feel comfortable riding public transportation because it's not safe and it's not clean. And he said, it's not our job. It's our job to build it. Well... Too bad. That's a bad business model. That just doesn't work in the real world. And um, until you, I say, take all the money you have allocated towards your big vision and, and public transportation and fix what we have and make it uh, safe and clean and have people actually pay instead of giving everybody a free ride under 18. And it still doesn't even bump up the number of people that ride on it still because it's not safe and it's not now. clean. It's, yeah, it's, it's 24. It's disgusting, and I wouldn't. I don't. I, I. I could probably throw a few punches, but I don't want to. You know, like I. I, I don't feel safe, and, and the only time you ride the trolley is if you are forced to, and that's the vision. That's the vision of Sandag right now: forcing you, making yes. it uncomfortable, yes. making it painful. Yep. Well, I, I told him back. And in, making us pay for it. I told him right. back in 2020 when they were trying to do the half percent sales increase. It's, 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 it's dead just, on arrival in East County. It's just awful. Yep. Their, their business model is broken because they're not business people. Well, we probably uh, have beat that okay, horse sorry. to death. Yeah. <laughs> what's, your real, what's your real business? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, it, you know, it, the peop, people out here, they're, they're hearing us talk about this, and you can clearly see that there's frustration uh, as the people that are elected to represent and having that rug pulled out from under us where we can't represent. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, it could be, you know, we uh, say let's pass out $50 bills. Well, you know what, they're going to be a complaint whether they're new bills or old bills and just can't win. So, anyways, that's all I have. Uh, city manager? Nothing, sir. City attorney. All right, then. Uh, we have no closed session items tonight. Therefore, this meeting is adjourned.